We are in week five of a sermon series we've been working through called The Wilderness. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about this wilderness experience in different ways, in different ways that, that God meets us in those places. We've talked about how this wilderness, how we typically look at it as this time that seems like it's real difficult and maybe desolate. It's times when it seems like God is, is far from us. But hopefully, through these last few weeks, you've been reminded of the ways that God is actually very faithful, very present. His promises that He reminds us of, that He is with us, that He is the God who sees us, and that He's good, even when things are hard and difficult. And I pray that those, those truths and those, those themes we've talked about over the last few weeks uh, are something that, that you hold on to. Maybe you're not in a season of, of a wilderness time, that your things are, are good, and that's great. <coughs> But these are things that we need to be reminded of because we will go through wilderness experiences. This morning we're going to look at at the wilderness um, experience maybe in a little bit of a different way. And so I want to begin with a story that's going to kind of give us a a starting point that as we work through the passage that we're going to be in today, that we're going to come back to the story and realize that there's more to how we see the wilderness than maybe what we first realize. The story is about Henry Martin, and he was a a distinguished scholar, unlike me. He was a Cambridge University student, and at 20 years old, he was honored for his achievements in mathematics. Only 20. In fact, he was given the highest recognition possible in that field, and yet he felt this emptiness inside. He said that instead of finding fulfillment in his achievements, he'd only, in his words, grasped a shadow. After evaluating his life goals, Martin sailed to India as a missionary at the age of 24. When he arrived, he prayed, Lord, let me burn out for you. What a prayer. Let me burn out for you. In the next seven years that preceded his death, I'm no math whiz, but that's only 27, he translated the New Testament into three difficult Eastern languages. I want you to hold on to this story as we look into our text this morning. And today, we're, I want to encourage you to be looking at this in the way that, that we're looking for a life that's found in the wilderness. Typically, the wilderness is an experience that we're just trying to get out of, right? The wilderness is a place that we're trying to move through this as quickly as we can to something else, to to life that's a little more comfortable, a little more trouble-free. But over these last few weeks, I'm discovering that that goal that I've had, and maybe you've had it too, I'm missing out on some important things, some important principles, some important opportunities that God has for me in that wilderness experience. Over the last few weeks, we've seen some of those. Today, we'll look at someone who is actually called to the wilderness, kind of like Henry Martin, called to the wilderness. And this individual we're going to be talking about this morning is as unique as, it, as, it, as they come. This individual is someone that responded to God in radical obedience, And he fulfilled this call of God with passion. And this was a hard and difficult call. To be one that was a voice of God in the wilderness. In your Bibles this morning, would you turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. We're going to be talking about John the Baptist. Many of you are familiar with the story and... And kind of know a little bit about him. He's always been one that we read a few uh, verses here and there about him. Jesus had some incredible words, descriptions of who he was. And I've always just kind of read these passages and just kind of seen it as, as he was the one that was declaring Jesus coming. 
and not thought a whole lot more about his life and realized the significance of the role that he played. Mark chapter 1, we're going to read the first eight verses. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we have this uniqueness of John the Baptist. And it's not so much that it was just his description that we read in this passage, but that God called him to a unique place. This is a unique place because a wilderness is something we try to get out of. And yet God called him to this place. And the uniqueness of John the Baptist is that he didn't run from this. He fully embraced this call of God to this place. And I think if we're to encounter somebody like John the Baptist today, he would probably be one that would make us kind of uncomfortable. He would be pretty eccentric. And that's just the thing about John the Baptist. He was somebody that was, as we would probably say today, uncivilized. In these verses, how is he described as we look at verse 6? What does it say? He wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. I don't know, imagine a guy with, out in the desert, I'm picturing crazy wild hair, maybe locust teeth, or locust legs sticking out of his teeth, I don't know, just (laughs) wild. Wearing this Robe, jacket, I don't know, consisting of of camel's hair. Not exactly someone we would see on the cover of GQ. (laughs) John is uncivilized. This kind of person is someone that kind of makes us uncomfortable. At least as I was looking at this and studying who John was, there was something in me that just was kind of uncomfortable. He's the kind of person that, if you were to see him today, if you knew John, you would probably kind of make some apologies for. Oh, John, he's he's a bit eccentric, a little off the wall, not your run-of-the-mill kind of guy. You have to look look past a few things. I'm sure deep down he's, he's a normal person. John is one of those guys that, if you were to put a twist on probably an old country song that I think some of you are familiar with, Mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Mamas don't let your babies grow up to be John the Baptist. Let them be doctors and lawyers and civilized people. And as I was thinking about John and that uncomfortableness, I I wasn't even aware of it initially. But there was something about who he is and what he did that kind of made me a little uncomfortable. It wasn't just what he wore. It wasn't his wild hair. Maybe I was a little jealous that he had hair and I don't. Or his diet. But John the Baptist is uncivilized. And maybe that's, that's the problem. If we were to look at somebody like John the Baptist today in, in the world that we live in, he would make us uncomfortable because he would be the kind of person that wouldn't live in a nice air-conditioned three-bedroom house with a white picket fence and a two-car garage. He wouldn't be the one that would marry his high school sweetheart and raise 2.3 kids. He's not the type of guy that would buy his clothes at J.C. Penney or his groceries at Walmart. John 
didn't even hold down a job. He turned his back on everything civilized, and he lives in the wilderness. And scripture just describes this Judean wild countryside. We know that John was the son of Zechariah, so he was entitled to the priesthood. That sounds like a civilized thing to do. To be a representative of God, to be someone fulfilling these duties in this place. But that's not what he did. Instead of ministering at the temple where normal civilized people would be, his temple is the desert. The altar is the Jordan River. And his robes are animal hides. John is everything that civilized sinners don't want to be. Maybe that's what made me uncomfortable. Look at the life of John and this call that God placed upon him to go to the wilderness. If the wilderness represents that place of desolation, man, I would struggle to go. And that's where he called him to be. And that's where we are. I'm going to get more into that here in a minute. John, as the one who's been called by God to prepare the way for Jesus, is in this wilderness and he's inviting us to come. To come out to this wilderness, away from the things that are civilized. This passage records that people came from Jerusalem. That's a civilized place. And they came from the countryside to where John was. Away from all of these things that are comfortable. And I think that that's, that's just it. What if civilization is actually the wilderness where we are duped into believing that this is what life's supposed to be all about? What if we've got it wrong? And see, that's what the kingdom of God is, is it's this upside down kingdom. And John the Baptist, he's unrelenting in this. He's the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. And John is the one that's beckoning us away from that place called civilization, where civilized sinners are all too easily duped into believing this is the life. We bought into a lie. He's inviting us to leave that place where we're easily tricked into believing that your job is your life. Your family is your life. Your possessions are your life. Those are the things we chase. Those are the things we value. Those are the things that we hold on to. And that's why we desperately try to climb out of this wilderness place. We've got it upside down. His invitation is to leave that place where trivial pursuit is not just a game, but it's a way of life. To leave that place where death masquerades as life. Where the person who is living it up, who seems to have it all together, who seems to have the life that we want, has made pleasure into a God. Where the person who is said to have lived a, a full life may have never lived a life that's baptized. Where real life has nothing to do with Christ but just getting by in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Month to month. Week to week. I've bought into that. And I think many of us have too. John's invitation is to leave that place where people think they have civilized sin. Where in fact, sin has transformed them into savages. Pursuing things that just move us further away from God. And that's why John makes us uncomfortable. That's why he makes me uncomfortable. That's why the religious leaders were uncomfortable around him. They kept demanding, who are you? Are you the, the Messiah? No. 
Are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? No. In the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the one, and he's pointing to Jesus, of the one who's to come. So what do we what do we do with this? What do we do with what we read here in this passage? What's the good news? Where, what is God doing? What is God saying? It's interesting to know, and this is maybe where I've kind of passed over some of these things before, but in John's ministry, baptism was a visible sign that a person had decided to change his or her life, giving up a sinful and selfish way of living and turning to God. But John, he took a known custom, and he gave it a new meaning. The Jews often baptized non-Jews who had converted to Judaism. So what John was doing was not unheard of, except that when he was baptizing Jews as a sign of repentance, this was a radical departure from Jewish custom. And we read in Acts how the early church took baptism a step further, associating it with Jesus' death and resurrection. So the purpose of John's preaching was to prepare people to accept Jesus as God's son. When John challenged the people to confess sin individually, he signaled the start of a new way to relate to God. It's transformative. And it's setting the the path to who Jesus is and what he would ultimately do. So John, the voice in the wilderness, calls these people out to the wilderness, into this barren desert where the only life there is water. I talked last week about if we are knowing that we're going to go through a desert experience... There are things that I don't want to take with me. I want to be packing light. There are things I want to leave behind that I don't want to take with me. And that's the thing about the wilderness. The wilderness is what strips away all of the things that we think are important. All the things that we hold on to. And John calls us into the wilderness, into the barren desert, where the only life is where there is water. John the Baptist, we call him. He's the water man. John beckons you out of this civilization, life civilized of sin, normalized into a wilderness repentance to lead you to the river of life. And once he's got you in the water, he's done his job. And that's when we encounter our Savior, Jesus Christ. John points and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Behold the Lamb of God who gives you the life of forgiveness in this water of baptism. Remember our story of Henry Martin? He gave his life to something more. A life that was found in the wilderness. In our scripture today, the invitation from John is for us to also find our life in the wilderness. The invitation from John is more than just moving away from the things that are civilized. It's a life of repentance. It's a life that's more full than we even realize. It's an invitation to also be bearers and heralds of this life of hope that is found only in the wilderness. I hope you see that the hope of life in Jesus is the one that's found in the wilderness. It's a life that's stripped away of the things that don't matter. It's a life of purpose. It's a life of meaning. It's a life of hope. It's a life that's way. 
It's a life that's upside down. And we've bought into this life that we think that if we have all of these things, that we've reached it. That's what matters. The life that matters is the one that's given. The life that matters is the one that surrendered to Jesus. Of a life that's only found in Him. True life. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would help us in these moments. As we look at our lives today, where do we find ourselves? Where, what have we placed our hope in? I pray, Lord, that as we, through the help of your Holy Spirit, look at our lives and look at our heart, that we would find some things that are unsettled, things that don't sit well within us, that we realize that maybe we've traded a life of true hope and meaning and purpose for things that really hold no value. Father, today I pray that we would see the truth that maybe the wilderness that we've been trying to avoid is the very place where you're offering us life. (coughs) Father, I pray that you would help us to hear your voice today. Father, I pray that you would help us to find the strength to turn to you, to repent of sin, of of pursuing a life that, that is apart from you. Help us, Father, today. Speak to our hearts. You are this voice crying out to us today to come find our life. You are the source of it. In you is life. Maybe today that's, that's a prayer we need to make for the very first time. Prayer of surrender, of, of repentance. Realizing that we need a Savior. Help us to pray that prayer today. Father, we ask and we pray these things in your name. Amen.